Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is Piyush Gupta, CEO of DBS Bank, which is one of the largest banks in Asia. This conversation is particularly timely. We're still feeling the fallout from the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, which shines a spotlight on how and why banks can get into trouble. The second major development is the emergence of AI language models such as ChatGPT. How is AI poised to transform banking and business in general? Who better to talk to than the CEO of a bank that's seen impressive business growth fueled in large part by tech? Piyush, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. Uh, very happy to join you, Asan. So Piyush, before we get started, tell us a little about yourself, you know, where you grew up, you know, what you read that impacted you, you know, events in your life that had that are memorable, you know, just something to uh, tell the world who you are. Well, we were chatting just before you put this, uh, the record switch on, Vasan, uh, about the one degree of separation. So I grew up in uh, New Delhi, which is where you did your um, uh, engineering undergrad from as well. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate. I spent 10, 12 years there, my, um, you know, primary education, my undergrad. Uh, and then when I got an MBA, a PGDM from uh, IIM in Ahmedabad. I call myself an accidental banker because, uh, like most people in Delhi, you want your aspiration was to join the civil service. In my case, I wanted to be a diplomat. Uh, but as things happened, um, you know, I got an offer from a multinational bank, uh, Citibank, and I found uh, I figured that that was uh, almost close to being a diplomat. You got to travel and see the world, and so I joined them, and I spent uh, you know well over twenty five years with them. Uh, started in India, I spent a lot of time in East Asia. Uh, bounced around Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and eventually wound up in Singapore. And some uh, 13, 15 years ago, I switched uh, from city to uh, run uh, DBS. Now, for your listeners, DBS is, I guess, the largest bank in Southeast Asia. We're somewhere around number 30 in the world in size. And uh, yeah, it's been a good run since then. You know, it's funny you talk about, you know, being a diplomat, because that was uh, one of my grandfather's biggest disappointments in me. You know, he wanted me to be a diplomat. So he was very disappointed when I went into the sciences and decided to do uh, engineering. You know, he was like, uh, almost wanted me to join the foreign service. So um, I had, after I joined City, my dad, who was also a bureaucrat, uh, flew down to where I was and tried to talk me out of it, said, you know, there's a lot more impact you can make uh, being with the government. 40 years later, I'm glad I didn't listen to him. Uh, indeed, indeed. You know, now that you mentioned Citibank, I, I think uh, I recall one of my uh, previous guests, Tom Davenport, mentioned that you were a protege of John Reed. Is that right? Well, that's correct. So he was CEO in some of my last few years. I did a few projects for him in the 90s. And uh, yeah, you could... Uh, say I was his prodigy. He tried to talk, you know, I quit banking for a year in the first internet uh, boom to set up a dot com. And uh, he spent a long time trying to talk me out of it. And, you know, to um, uh, uh, be fair to the to the man, he actually turned around and uh, he thought about it. He said, look, I think you're doing the right thing. Go try it. And if it doesn't work, uh, come back. Now, as you can imagine, it didn't work. It turned out to be a dot bomb. And so within less than a year, I was back at his door and said, you know, I think I'm cut out to be a banker. So what was that dot-com about, just out of curiosity? You know, I was, um, I'd done a bunch of stuff in City, which is unusual. I'd done, um, you know, e-commerce related work very early in the late 90s. So my background was different from most CEOs. I had some technology, uh, the back office kind of stuff. And so some people I knew from uh, what eventually was JP Morgan Chase, at that time they called themselves something different, tied up with the Hindustan Times group, with the Bharatiyas to set up a general portal in India, sort of like a Yahoo in those days. And uh, they gave me sweat equity to come and run it. So I moved back to Delhi, I set up a 100 people team. And actually we made uh, very good progress in the first few months. I had a 
security services, a securities company, brokerage company, which eventually is HDFC Securities. In that, uh, you know, this thing, we had a job search company, sort of like Nokri.com. Uh, we had a matrimonial company, etc. We set up four or five quick companies. The problem was this was um, early 2000. NASDAQ tanked in April, and the rest, as they say, is history. So we just could never get it going. Yeah, indeed, I remember that so well. The the Nasdaq tanking. I was uh, heading for a break to the Caribbean, uh, sitting at JFK watching the news, and there was this guy, analyst called Dan Dan Niles. I'll never forget this. And he just said, "Sell, sell, sell, just just sell." And uh, by the time I got to Tortola, I think uh, you know he'd been proved right. Yeah, uh, that was that, that, that was... everything. Everything sold around me. My, uh, you know. Funders decided they wanted to pull out of all B2C. I spent a few months trying to get some strategic partners. I talked to Yahoo, Lycos, etc. at that time. And, uh, you know, six months in, I figured we weren't going to get anywhere. So I pulled the plug on it. Yeah, you know, well, there's this famous Bob Marley line, right? When when, do when, when one door is closed, another is open. So uh, it opened up a good door for you. Yeah, that's true. Can't complain. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we live in interesting times and people say it's a Chinese proverb, but actually it apparently it isn't. You know, we've had some amazing events happen in the last uh, few months. You know, we've had, you know, chat GPT that sort of captivated the world. You know, we had this uh, Silicon Valley bank collapse. So let's start with, with that Silicon Valley thing. Like, you know, why does this keep happening with such alarming regularity? You know, despite the fact that, you know, the financial services sector is the most highly regulated. You know, I was talking to my colleague, David Yermak, um, last year, and I said, you know, the U.S. has the most trusted financial system in the world. And he corrected me. He says, no, we have the least untrusted, which is sort of an interesting way of putting it. But why does this keep happening with such regularity? So let me uh, first uh, reflect on your last comment. You know, Edelman does this trust index uh, barometer. Actually, uh, banking in the U.S. is not very trusted. Banking in other parts of the world is actually extraordinarily well trusted. In Singapore, where I live, uh, banks are trusted uh, more than anybody else in the country, as uh, up there with the government. And for actually, DBS, we trusted about 8 percentage points higher than anybody else in the system. So I don't think it's appropriate to say that banks are generally, as an industry, not trusted or untrusted. I think it depends on the environment a little bit. But to your broader question, Alan, you know, first of all, you've got to figure out banks are businesses. Businesses fail. So the notion that there's something peculiar about banks which will, you know, keep them from failing uh, is that fundamentally valid. You know, all businesses fail. If you look at the Fortune 500 over the last 50 years, I mean, how many of them are around? That's the nature of business. You put capital to work, you take risk. And in the taking of risk, you know, times change, events change, and uh, we sometimes make it, sometimes we don't. In banking in particular, the two sources of, uh, you know, what is the role of a bank? In fundamental terms, we intermediate risk and we intermediate time. Our intermediate risk because consumers give us the money because they are wary of taking direct risk on borrowers. So we take the money from consumers, we intermediate, and then we choose to take risk on different kinds of borrowers. Uh, and then we intermediate time because most households want liquidity. So they have short-term savings and they put it into bank and savings accounts, whereas companies who need to build businesses want long-term capital. And so we take the short term money and we give it out long term. And so you have an intermediation of uh, time. Uh, and in intermediate risk and time, you're effectively taking risk. You can regulate a lot of it. You can say put in a lot more capital, keep a lot more liquidity, try and protect yourself. But that doesn't change the underlying substance of the risk taking that you do. I mean, there is risk in the business. And therefore, like every other uh, industry or entity, you have individual organizations that run afoul because the risk management is not as good uh, as it needs to be at a particular point in time. Now, what happens is, it's a, the peculiar part of our industry is this, that our principal raw material is money, and our raw material can run away or run out very, very quickly at unexpected times. So when we intermediate risk, it really tends to uh, create a problem of solvency. So if we wind up making some bad loans, you take a charge to capital and you, you, you know, if you use up all your capital, you're no longer solvent. But the intermediation of time actually creates a risk of liquidity. And that's because, like I said, you know, households give us short term money, we give it out long term. And so if households come back and withdraw their money in spades, you're left hanging. Uh, in general, 
actuarial science tells you that everybody is not going to take the money out at the same time. And therefore, there you wound up with the fractional reserve system. So once you get deposits, you keep X amount and reserves and the rest of it you lend out, knowing that everybody is not going to take it out. But sometimes fear takes over. And when fear takes over and large numbers of people start taking out the money unexpectedly, then you just have to have the systems to be prepared to handle that kind of event. You know, If that were to happen, what are you going to do about it? And that's the fundamental risk management. Some, like in the case of SVP, I don't think they did a great job thinking about what would happen if large chunks of money left suddenly. Now, to be fair to them and to be fair to everybody, I think a couple of things have happened in the last few years which are driven by our subject technology, which have push banks to have to rethink this whole liquidity management uh, agenda. Um, the one is this nature of fear. And in the old days, if somebody got worried about a bank, it took a few days, weeks, even months for that fear to spread around. In today's day and age, uh, as you know, your fear messages, the meme or the small video clip gets viral in 30 minutes. Peter Thiel decides early in the morning that he's a little worried about SVP. And by 9.30, all of his 40,000 best friends have seen the same video. Uh, and therefore, the pace at which this fear takes over has changed completely in a world of social media and eco chambers. The second big difference that's happened is in the old days when money had to run out, it ran out slowly. Because people had to line up in front of banks, queues at ATMs. You know, you took an empty bag to put currency in. How much money are you going to put in a bag to take out? Uh, today, you press a button, the money moves. And therefore, digital banking and the capacity to move money electronically has changed the pace at which that money can disappear. So SVB lost $42 billion in one afternoon. And that even 10 years ago would have been unimaginable because it's impossible to take $42 billion out of a bank in the physical world. And therefore, some of these dimensions of technology are causing banks to rethink this liquidity management issue. You know, under stress, how bad can it get? How quickly can it get bad? And therefore, what would you need to do, which is different from what you did in the past? Right, right. Yeah, that makes that you know that all makes a lot of sense, uh, Piyush. Uh, I guess you know my question, and and I guess and the associates surprised with this is around the risk management that Silicon Valley Bank seem to have. You know, I wrote this article in Fortune where I called them a hedge fund in disguise, and you know I reflected on that and I asked myself, was I being particularly unkind? You know, in, in saying that. But on the other hand, I felt like they had sort of taken a macro view on, on things as well. You know, that's, you know, they, they invested you know, heavily in treasuries, unhedged. I guess hedging is costly. And so they were really vulnerable to, to this kind of thing. The other thing that I couldn't help noticing was that, you know, and I wrote about this as well, you know, from 1993 to, you know, the peak of the market in 2011, they grew something like 250 fold, you know, as opposed to JP Morgan, which grew nine fold. And I was thinking, you know, banks basically have similar cost of borrowing, you know, maybe Silicon Valley has a slightly higher cost of money than JP Morgan, how could they possibly be growing at that pace? So, you know, that sort of baffled me. And I just wondered, you know, was I particularly unkind? I in, think you were. Calling them a hedge fund? So first of all, the second part of your question, I mean, you're a, you're a science geek. I mean, 250 times zero is, uh, you know, zero. <laughs> so when you start from nothing, growing 250 times is not such a big deal. And then I, I would argue at the end of 30 years, there were $250 billion balance sheet. DBS has been around 50 years. We have a $500 billion balance sheet. So it's not that far off. We're at, we started as a development bank. And if you compare the bank, SVB growth to many of the other banks in Asia and the region, you take the Indian banks. Uh, Kotak Bank is like 15 years old. Um, HDFC Bank is 25 years old. And uh, so SVB Bank is not extraordinarily large or um, you know very uh, uh, distinctive in the pace of growth. And your other earlier comment in terms of uh, being a hedge fund, so I tell you, all of these things are a question of balance. Believe me, every bank in the world uh, does what SVB does, which is you take a chunk of your money and you put it into duration. Like I said, banks borrow short and they tend to put on duration. When you put on duration, you do it in a couple of ways. The whole market is focused on the fact that they had fixed term uh, bonds. Frankly, whether you have fixed term loans or fixed term bonds, it doesn't matter. And for some reason, the market has got fixated about the idea that they were in 20, 25 year US treasuries. What happened if they were in 20 year fixed rate mortgages? Would that have made the position any better? Of course not. 
and it's just the markets are imagination that my god they were in bonds and they could have been in 20 years in mortgages for all you cared and it wouldn't it would have created the same problem so the question of balance is the following one is how long do you go on duration right and i think if you look at the duration in the book it's on the longer side um part of it is a reflection of the market um, you know in asia we just don't have deep capital markets and so you don't get access to that kind of duration so most asian banks duration would tend to be much much shorter but even in the us i think the duration is on the longer side the bigger challenge is how much are you prepared to put into the duration book how much are you prepared to go long and that's where i think they missed a complete trick because most banks if you look at their you know longer tenor uh, bond if i just think there'll be maybe 10 15 20 percent of the book in the case of silicon valley bank it was 75 percent of the book and to me that's the big question that when you do liquidity risk management and you are constantly looking at how do i get liquidity in case of a crisis you cannot afford to put three fourths of your entire liquidity into long term assets and so it's a question of how much and where is the balance right and i think that's where the fundamentally got wrong right so there's another sort of theme i want to push on here you know i mentioned david yermak uh, so you know one of the things he said during a conversation was you know there's too many banks you know th- th- we don't need so many banks and you know the system is kind of antiquated banks do sort of the dirty work for the fed of you know doing kyc and all that kind of stuff but we don't really need this many banks a lot fewer would be fine like what's your view on on this, this is are a, there too many banks there's a particular us problem it's not a global problem the us had 14 15000 banks they've been culled down to last i saw 8 or 9000 banks right uh, and the reason for this is historical banking was a state subject there was no national banking since so every state created its own bank and then glass steagall compounded the problem on top of that so you not only wound up with having geographic fragmentation you also wound up with functional fragmentation and so you wound up with large numbers of banks in the us i remember in my days at city uh, we talked about john reed uh we struggled hard to get a national banking license you couldn't get it you had to go state by state get a license and you wound up with presence in six states or seven states now for a bank in those days like city group to be in seven out of 50 states in the us that's absurd right now, if you go to china which is i guess what half two thirds of the size of the us they've got 200 banks they don't have 9000 banks they've got 200 banks Right. and so yes without a doubt the us is massively massively overbanked in terms of the number of banks is definitely an opportunity to uh, consolidate it's been happening to be fair but uh, not as fast as you know you would like to shoe horn it or shepherd it do you do you see a day where individuals will have their own accounts for the fed it could be that's you know you think about um, cbdc a retail cbdc uh, world that's effectively what you could do and you could do a retail cbdc in two ways you could intermediate it through the banks in which case you did the cbdc through the banking system or the fed could uh, open accounts directly for people there's two challenges or three challenges in that which is why most uh, central banks are very reluctant right now to go down that path the first challenge uh, with that is that um, uh, you obviously disintermediate your existing banking system and that has implications on jobs and a whole industry uh, in countries where the banking sector is 15% of the economy you know there's a huge issue in taking out 15% of the economy and that's not straight forward the other issue with that is um, you know if you do a, a parallel like you want to keep banks as well as open accounts with the central bank or the fed then in a run this kind of situation svb you create massive systemic risk because everybody will move the money to the fed account and so not just one svb you could then destabilize the whole banking system so half and half doesn't work you either got to go the whole hog and like eliminate the banking system and go straight to the central bank or not and the third challenge i talked to some central bankers is the challenge of credit creation today when you say the banks are do the work for the fed the biggest work they do is what i said intermediate risk they make the judgment call on who do we give loans to who is credit worthy and who do we give loans to if the banks are not doing that then the fed has to do that and for the central bank to take the owners to say who do i give credit to in the country is not only very difficult you need like you know millions of people it's also very politicized you know so who do you wind up giving credit to so as a consequence my own sense is that uh, you will get central cbdcs retail cbdcs but they likely to be the intermediate in model the central bank will go through the banking system and the banking system do it as opposed to open direct accounts for citizens yep that uh, certainly makes a lot of sense i can see the complexity especially about around sort of dismantling a system that you know employs 
millions of people. Uh, I can see that that would not be a great political choice. So let's uh, let's talk about technology, you know, which is, uh, you know, of great interest to me. And, you know, it's been a, a big part of your career. Are you surprised at all by the emergence of these language models like chat GPT? Like, did you actually, did you, did you imagine you'd see something like this in your lifetime? Oh, I imagined it for sure. I was surprised by the progress that's been made. So, you know, in 2013, we were one of the first uh, guinea pigs, uh, pilots with IBM for the use of Watson, when they came up with Watson for, you know, natural language uh, uh, processing and so on. And my vision at that time, to I imagine, was that I'd plug Watson into Bloomberg. Watson would read Bloomberg in real time and be able to read all the graphs, charts, everything. And they would know, therefore, instantly, you know, whether Chile had gone up or whether gold should be down or what happened to the Apple stock. And on the other side, they would re read the half a million wealth portfolios I have and would constantly keep figuring out, hey, you know, Vasant has got too much gold or Piyush has got too little silver. They'd match it and make recommendations every morning to rebalance your portfolio. That was my vision. Uh, Watson, you know, didn't work for us because I realized that natural language processing at that time turned out to be quite primitive. It was clunky. First of all, it couldn't read graphs. It couldn't read pie charts. It couldn't read pictures. But it also, it was doing sentence parsing. And therefore, I still remember vividly, there was a sentence called, Greece is not yet too big to fail. And it could not get the context of that. It read, not yet too big to fail, and basically decided that Greece was too big to fail. Right? So after 18, 24 months of trying, we gave up because it was just not giving us the value that we wanted. Fast forward, a few years later, I invested in a New York-based company called Kai Casisto. They have an AI natural language model called Casisto which we invested in, and we actually used it to plug into our call centers to be able to do chat. So we wanted people to talk and Casisto would do the response. And even though it was in the domain of financial services, and we trained the, we trained the models like heck, despite that, the accuracy rate of being able to answer a good conversation was about 85, 87%. And what that means is that one in every six or seven callers would get completely absurd information. Now, that's not good enough to put into the market. You know, one in six, seven times, you're talking nonsense. So we sort of crafted what we call guided conversations. We did not let it lose on open conversations. We would craft it into a yes-no situation. The AI tool, Casisto, would handle the understanding, but would go through a series of guided conversations to make sure we got the output right. So when you say, could you imagine? Yes, this is my vision of where the world is going. However, what ChatGPT showed in November, I had not kept pace. I did not know that we had evolved so far. And GPT-3 and GPT-4, I think they're complete game changers. Uh, to me, I've often felt tech, chat GPT in four months has rekindled my dystopian view of how this is going to be really impactful on the future of everybody, not just banking, of everybody. I mean, today, from your, your MOOC or large language models, the capacity to do what a person can do is just extraordinary. Say, say more about this dystopian fear, because I, I think I share some of these concerns, but I'm just curious, what, what's what's sort of part of your dystopian view around these uh, language models and AI? Well, I tell you the, the three levels. One is just productivity. Uh, Goldman Sachs did the report recently, right, which said 30% of jobs can go. I can see for the first time, I can see line of sight to that in my own business. So you take chat GPT, it can write, read better, it can write better. I'll give you, I mean, everybody's got anecdotes today. But certainly in our case, we've got 10 different projects running with chat GPT or generative AI models to essentially do minute taking in meetings, to write our annual reports, to write up our research papers, to send marketing material to our customers. So everything which I have a team of five, seven, eight people doing today, I can do with one person, or maybe even zero um, uh, very soon. And so it's quite clear to me that the productivity that you get from some of these things is uh, massive. And you're going to see the impact of that within 12 months. Uh, it's not going to be 5, 7, 8, 10 years. You're going to see the productivity impact of this come through. The question then is, will these lost jobs be replaced by something else? And that's always the you know million dollar question. New jobs get created. Um, and so it is possible that you could find new users and new jobs and people will drift to um, uh, different things to do. I've, I've been quite at DBS, we've been quite uh, uh, fortunate that so far we've been able to reskill people to do different jobs, the jobs the technology has taken out. 
But as I look forward, it's not entirely clear to me that I can find the jobs for the kinds of skill sets and people that a chat GPT could take out. So that's just a productivity and job loss uh, issue. But the bigger issue to me is uh, the fundamental questions of, uh, you know, how do you start making the distinction between a robot and a human? You know, you know I, I, when I was a kid, I read a lot of Asimov, you know, the three, the three rules of uh, thou shall do no harm. But, you know, when you get to where you are today, it's becoming very hard. I'll give you an anecdote. Um, you know, I'm, I'm chair of the local university here, one of the universities. One of my board members was uh, finishing his nine-year term and retiring. So he got chat GPT to write up a farewell message. And, you know, he gave him a couple of inputs and chat GPT wrote a fantastic message. He circulated it to us and said, you know, this is both passed and failed the Turing test. Uh, it's passed the Turing test because it's obviously it's perfect. You can't make out that it wasn't a human being. He said it's failed the Turing test because I couldn't have written it that well. So the fact that it's so well written proves that it must have been done by a computer. Now, you're getting to the state where you really genuinely believe that the AI and robot is going to do better than you can do. You can't even make out, right? So when you get to the state where it's difficult to make that distinction, then you start worrying. And they start worrying in a, in a philosophical realm. You know, what makes us human beings? So let me give you two uh, examples. AI models and this whole thing of bias and models, and you put it into not just generative AI in general. You know, my industry uh, is an industry which is built on discrimination. That's what we're paid to do, to discriminate between good borrowers and bad borrowers. That's what my shareholders expect me to do, to give money to people who are going to pay it back. But when I build an AI model, which does the same thing and does it better than I can, which is discriminate between good and bad borrowers, that creates a lot of consternation in society. True, it could let, lead to you know red lining and black lining and you, you sort of don't do some geographies and don't do some ethnicities. But that's what the AI is telling you, that those are the better pairs and those are the worst pairs. So how do you deal with that in a society where you really want to help the disadvantage, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I'll give you the a second example, which is even more compelling to me. Think about the insurance industry. The insurance industry is based on a fundamental premise that none of us know where the risk is, so we mutualize the risk. We all, we all share the risk. If all of us are sitting in a room, we don't know who's going to get cancer, we all put money in a kitty, which is premium, and the person who gets cancer basically withdraws the money. Now, what happens when we all know? When AI tells you with 100% surety that Piyush is going to get cancer and Vasant is not, end of insurance uh, industry, because Vasant will never take insurance, and all the people who know they're not getting cancer don't want to pay the premium, and the people who know they're getting cancer, nobody wants to insure them. So then you've got to go and say, is too much information a bad thing? Is too much intelligence a bad thing? Because it changes the construct of all of us as human beings in society. We want to socialize our pain. We want to socialize our problems. But when we know too much and the AI tells us, then we won't do it anymore. So these are not questions of STEM. These are questions of philosophy. You know, what makes us human beings? To what extent do we want to share? Do we want, to what extent do we want to, you know, like a share burden, share happiness? I think our biggest challenges are going to be these. And the problem is we haven't even started thinking about them. I mean, there's some think tanks you do, but in a systemic way, at a platform level, you know, AI is just racing down the path and nobody started thinking about what are the things that can go wrong? How do we put guardrails? How do we decide what is not appropriate to do? And none of it is clear at all. You know, one of my favorite books was is, um, The Passions and the Interests. There's a guy called Hirschman, a Dutch philosopher scientist in the 1970s. And in a nutshell, he basically says that before 1700, the world was organized by passions, which is the passion of conquest. And so the warrior prince was the you know head of the, the system. And the merchant or the capitalist was reviled. They weren't uh, well regarded. It, society, it took society 200 years, Adam Smith, Bacon, Locke, etc., to get to a view that... Uh, you know, uh, guided self-interest, which he calls interest as opposed to passion, is a better organizing principle for society because it leads to a better allocation of resources and let, less bloodshed. But society took 200 years to evolve. Today, we need society to evolve, not in 200 years, but in 10 years, to try and figure how we're going to handle this massive pace of change. And I don't think we're equipped for it. So that's the dystopian view. Wow, that's 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 really interesting and, and quite profound. I mean, when you started talking initially, I thought like, well, this sounds utopian, you know, like the, the machine is doing all these things, it's summarizing meetings, it's creating research reports, it's telling you whether your investments are, you know, unbalanced. I was like, wow, this is this is amazing, right? But 
I guess as you've uh, as you've been talking through this, I, I see exactly uh, what you mean by the potential for dystopia. So, where do you see things going? I mean, where do you see banking going? And you know, so so what, what's the future going to look like of of banking with in this new brave world of AI? So, and so this is why it's such a hard problem. And you know, I struggle. This is my biggest struggle, honestly. Between what is the right thing to do? Because on the one hand, if I don't leverage the tools that are coming along, if I don't leverage the AI, generative AI, drive productivity in the system, by the way, the other utopian part of it, you can create extraordinary outcomes for customers and people. You know, we can tell people things they don't know. Today, I use about 300 AI models in the bank, uh, 300 use cases, some 600 models. And you turn on my mobile banking app, first thing it'll tell you in the morning is, hey, I think you made a duplicate payment or your electricity bill looks too high compared to your neighbors or et cetera, et cetera. These are things we could never do in the old world. Today, I've got AI models running which do all of this stuff. My AI models allow me to give credit to parts of the population who had never banked before. But my AI models tell me that they're credit worthy so I can do it and so on. So, you know, there's a lot of plus, but there is this dystopian view as well. So there could be minus. I've tried to sort of uh, put the thread to the needle. We've got something called uh, appropriate use of uh, data and AI committee. So all our use of data and AI goes to this committee. We've created a rubric called PURE. PURE stands for purposeful, unsurprising, respectful, and explainable. So all data and models must meet the PURE principle before we put them to use. But in truth, it's an art and not a science. So every time a model comes up, we sit and debate actively about whether this is the right thing to do or not. And I'm sure half the times we get it wrong, you know, whether it's the right thing to do. My worry is also at least, you know, I believe at least we go through a process. It seems to me that a lot of companies and people I talk to don't even have a process to think about the issues right now, right? So when you ask me what's the future of the industry, it's hard for me to predict that. Uh, but I have to say, I think it's going to be um, challenging. By the way, it also makes it more challenging because there's no absolute, there's no absolute truth. So let me give you an example of use of data. Uh, you know, how we think about data and privacy varies very much from culture to culture. The West thinks about data very differently from the way the East thinks about data and data use. When COVID happened, in the first day, we had a case early in February 2020. Uh, my AI team used a bunch of data, door, door tap data, Outlook data, uh, meetings data, and within an hour, created the first contact tracing out, you know, output for the bank. You know, who were your first first degree contact, second degree contact. And I published it by the evening. So everybody knew whether they were at risk, whether they needed to quarantine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I did an op-ed in the Financial Times saying this is the power of data and how well you can use it. I got flamed. And that's the maximum I ever got flamed by people in the West saying you had no right to use the employee data to do this stuff. Whereas all my employees in Asia loved it. I, they were saying this is the best thing that happened because it kept us all safe. So the notion of collective use of data for good outcomes, social outcomes, relative to individual rights over data, it's a very East and West concept. So there's no absolute. By the way, there's absolute. There's no absolute by generation. Young people think about data and giving up data differently from older people. And frankly, it's not even absolute in your own mind. In the morning, you say, I'm not going to give up my data. In the afternoon, you find that somebody is giving you 30% off on the next golf set. So you quite happily give him your email. Most people tell me, I ask them, would you like to be, you know, 24-7 big brother tell you where you are? Everybody says no. I say, okay, show me your mobile phone. Your uh, Every app has got location on. So in reality, your actions belie what you think you're doing. You're telling everybody where you're on all the time, even though you think you don't want to do it because you're trading it off for the convenience you get in the Waze app or the Google Map app or wherever you're trading it off. So... Part of the problem is not just what is right or wrong. Part of the problem is there's no absolute. And the problem is even we don't know. And we keep changing in respect of what we want from morning to afternoon to evening. So there's a lot of imponderables to try and solve for us. And that's that's the issue. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned bias earlier as being, you know, something that's sort of front and center these days. And I hear about this all the time. Is this also something that's largely cultural? That is, you know, there's a lot more concern around bias, you know, let's say in the US and the West in general than there is in the rest of the world? Well, I don't know. I mean, certainly in Singapore, we work actively with the regulators. The MAS has got a set of principles for, you know, it's called FEET. It stands for FAIR, something, something. I'm on a national council for ethical use of AI and data. 
And so the issue of bias is definitely front and center in all our discussions. How do you make sure that you don't have bias? But the challenge, of course, is where, if I wonder, where there's intended bias or unintended bias. My example of being a bank, of course, we want bias. I don't want to give loans to everybody, right? I, I need the model to be biased towards people who are more credit worthy. But then, you know, how do you actually figure out what bias is acceptable because it's serving a purpose of what is not? And that's where things start falling up a little bit apart. Uh, the other issue, as I said, the East and West, there is a general difference between individual rights versus, uh, you know, social rights and social responsibilities, without a doubt. And therefore, when you come to bias and say individuals biased against, but society benefits, I think there's a lot more acceptance of that in um, uh, the Asian context, that that might be an acceptable uh, bias. So coming back to the use of data, you know, one of the things that, you know, when I when I was reading Tom's book, All In On AI, he talked about DBS Bank. And, uh, you know, what got my attention was this, you know, his description that, you know, when people are having problems with your app, you actually know it in real time and you can step in to help them, right? So I was like, wow, that that's very interesting, sort of this notion of sort of real time touch with your customers. Where do you draw the line between that being helpful and that being creepy and, and intrusive? Or is that one of those things where you say, well, maybe we'll get it right, maybe we'll get it wrong? Yeah, so, you know, we have instrumented everything. And uh, we instrumented everything for this reason that um, we can track. In the old days, you need to do surveys of customers to figure if you know things are okay or not. Today, I've got in every one of my meeting rooms, every one of my journey rooms, everywhere, I've got big screens. And we are constantly tracking data feeds in real time. It's like a you know air traffic control control tower, and it gives us the best insights on what is going wrong anywhere in the system in real time, any point of time. We then put AI models on, on top of that, so it picks up anomalies and picks up what we need to really focus on. So far, from a customer standpoint, we've not uh, had this thing about you know tracking my movements on your apps is creepy. So. But let me give you a different example, which uh, actually speaks to your point. One of the other AI models that we have is in our human resources, where uh, we use AI to predict who's going to quit the company in the next uh, you know, six to 12 months. And with some amazing accuracy, 84, 85% accuracy, we can tell who's going to quit the company. Now, to be able to do that, we use data feeds, which uh, reflect complete employee behavior. You know, what time you log on to your computer in the morning, what you do through the day, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives us this. Now, then the, our, our big dilemma was, is it appropriate to do? We could obviously tell our employees we're doing it, but it still raises the question, you know, are you being big brothers or too creepy? Uh, we finally rest on the fact that it depends on what you want to use it for and how do you guard and protect the use of the data, the use of the outcome. In our case, we use it to actually work with employees who we think might be a benefit from coaching, handholding, and to try and give them a reason to stay on in the company. And so I think that's a positive outcome, both for the employee as well as for the company. Right? But there, then the onus is on us to make sure that the use of the stuff is really good. So, you know, I'm going back to question as earlier. So where do you think the future of some of this stuff? You know, I sort of think that in the future, this notion of appropriateness and suitability is going to guide many of our actions. It's not. It's very hard to regulate. You can't regulate away availability of data. You can't regulate away the fact that the cameras and airports and cameras everywhere are everywhere capturing a movement. You can't regulate away the fact that you have a large digital footprint that everybody is being able to track all the time. So if you can't do it like that, then you've got to do is it finally, what was the outcome? What did you achieve from it? And was it appropriate and suitable? Now, I, the best analogy to it for me is how do you control a gun versus how do you control a knife? You know, in, other than your country. So in most normal countries, you control a gun through a licensing regime. So you need to go get a license before you can go buy a gun. But you control a knife through appropriateness, suitability, and use. Anybody can buy a knife at any hardware store. You control a knife by saying, did you use it to you know, chop your vegetables and uh, cut your apple? Or did you, did you use it to go stab somebody? And if you used it for cutting the apple, it's an appropriate use. If you went and used it to stab somebody, it's not, and you get thrown into jail. I think the use of data and AI will eventually have to go there, which goes back to my thing. The answer will be in philosophy and what is right and what is not right. And the judgments would have to come from there as opposed to, you know, STEM technology and so on. Sort of more around intent. You know, so uh, something you were uh, talking about earlier sort of 
sparked something completely different in my head. This notion, you know, because you were talking about being able to predict whether someone might leave. And I was, uh, and my question was going to be, well, why would you want to do that? And and you, know, you answered that as you went along, which is that, you know, we, we'd like to uh, lower attrition, keep employees happy, keep them productive. One of the things I've always wondered, and, and this is, you know, whenever someone walks out of the door, there's a huge loss of knowledge that goes with it. And this happens, you know, with human beings across generations, you know, a generation passes away, huge loss of knowledge uh, that happens, right? There's, we, 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 we tend to forget a lot. And the same thing seems to happen in business, right? There's a fair amount of attrition, people come and go. And, you know, I'm wondering whether one of the sort of longer use of these uh, language models and AI will be to actually retain knowledge within organizations, right? I mean, you can have a, in principle, you can have an avatar of anyone um, that basically, you know, keeps track of, you know, the kinds of things they know, what they do, uh, you know, stuff that might be useful going forward, sort of a collective institutional memory. Actually, Vasat, step one, you know, there's a huge value to that even before we get to where you are, which is that a large part of the, it's not the wisdom, but the knowledge is actually somewhere captured in the company. It's in some record, it's in some file, it's in some call report, it's in some credit memo, it's in some something somebody wrote up. And yeah, but it's very that, illiquid, right? It's, it's very illiquid. It ah, just correct. sits there. And, so yeah. what, what already, one of I told you, we have 10 use cases. One of our first use cases is that, that today you can use a generative AI, chat GPT, one of these guys, to change the notion of search. And so I don't have to do guided search. I just go and say, hey, you know, I need to know something about the oil and gas industry in Peru. And it'll go through everything in our records and pull out everything related to that in a very meaningful way saying this is what we know about this industry. And it will tap into the knowledge of anybody who has left the company but who wrote up something before, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a game changer for us. You know, the knowledge knowledge management systems and companies in the past have been primitive because you got to the clunk, you got to organize for data, how much data can we capture? How do you, you know, do metadata? How do you search for it? It's impossible. But this changes it. So today our first use case is this. Uh, my call center operators and my frontliners today have struggled to answer questions of employees. Somebody in the company knows whether the person is there now or was there before. Somebody knows. The chat GPT allows us to access that in a far more meaningful way than we could before. Now, to your next thing, could I then, if effectively anybody is quitting, before you quit, I make sure I get an avatar of you and I hold it and hold your knowledge. I mean, that's quite a cool idea. Uh, but even before that, what you said is absolutely correct. As a store of knowledge and a search of knowledge, it's a game changer. How else do you see AI and technology impacting the banking industry? And where I'm going with this is, you know, when uh, you know, I spent several years on Wall Street in the '90s, where we would do scenario analysis. You know, we would, you know, construct, you know, two by twos, and you know, the axes could be something like, you know, regulation, uh, you know, less, more, or interest rates go up or down, or technology does doesn't progress as as fast as we think, or we we sort of come up with these axes and try and describe the world in each of these scenarios, and then say, are we prepared? You know, which which is the most more likely to scenario to pan out, and are we prepared for that? How do you think about? strategy in today's world? You know, you, you must do similar kinds of analyses. And if so, like, how do you pick those axes? You know, what would be the, you know, if you were to sort of take a Harvard Business School sort of two by two view of things, how would you describe that? Actually, wasn't I don't. For some reason, I think it's very hard to call. You know, the pace of change is not only fast, it's accelerating. And so, like I said, you know, no matter what we did, I'm not sure I picked up Chat GPT in June. I, I'm reminded in the in the mid '90s, I was put in charge of emerging market strategy for City, and we sat in Oxford for a few months and we, you know, did this uh, exercise of uh, future planning. We, we pretended we were in 2000. We were looking back and saying what happened to the world in five, six years, and so we used that to, you know, build a strategy uh, a formulation. As things happened in 2000, when I was quitting to go to my dot com, I was, you know, uh, culling my papers and I found that document. And I went and looked at it. We got nothing of consequence right. 
We missed the mobile phone revolution. We missed LTCB. We missed all the big things that happened in the world. So this might just mean you've got to have a point of view, of course, on the future, but it's very hard to call. Therefore, I think strategy is really about building a capability and uh, nimbleness, adaptability. How quickly can you respond to a constantly changing set of inputs? And how do you make sure you have capability in the company to be able to respond to many things? So, for example, in the last few years, I've got small groups of people. I have a small group of people who are working on blockchain and DeFi because Web3 and DeFi could happen. I've got a small group of people working on metaverse because, you know, the metaverse world could happen. Uh, I've got a bunch of people who are using AI. And then at any point in time, we figure which are the next best use cases, where do we put some extra dollars in, and where do we drive the agenda further? So we keep building capability and we make sure that we're constantly keeping the capacity to pivot to what we think might uh, might be the next thing or might have some uh, some legs, right? Uh, technology is going to change everything. And I, if you ask my view, uh, AI is obviously data and AI is massive, but uh, blockchain and the impact of a distributed ledger world is equally consequential. It's gone off the front burner in the last two years because of the crypto collapse. But if you think about the underlying notion, which is you don't need a hub and spoke uh, organizing system anymore, uh, it's a game changer. Do you need stock exchanges? Do you need banks? Do you need central banks? Do you need registrar of societies? If everybody can keep track of everything in real time, it changes the whole model. How could you use that model differently? So it could be a complete game changer. Uh, I will tell you, I've still not been able to get my mind around the meta in terms of the use cases, but it is a fact that 3 billion people are doing virtual gaming every day. It, there are only 2 billion people who play physical sports. So obviously, there's a whole universe out there who's willing to spend 6, 8, 10 hours in this make-believe world. I mean, if that's the case, then you have to figure how you're going to respond to that. You know, what do you leverage it for? So my thing is build capability, make sure you have several, you know, uh, irons in the fire, uh, and then constantly keep thinking about, you know, how do you want to pivot to what you think is really going to be relevant? I want to push a little bit more of, of uh, on this DeFi front, because you're right, it has gone off the burner. And last year, it was like front and center. Everything was blockchain, 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 DeFi. I, I sort of, I see the the benefits of blockchain. And yet at the same time, there are these skeptics. There's, you know, there were a hundred scientists who wrote this letter to some subcommittee in Congress saying, look, you know, this technology is distributed databases. It's existed for a long time. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing is, is a lot of scams and, and, um, sort of scam artists. And I don't know. I, I, I sort of have taken a step back and I, I, you know, I guess philosophically I ask myself, can you really have a truly, truly decentralized system? Is that really possible? You know, without any trusted institution or authority? You know, I mean, is, is that really going to happen? Is that feasible? Yeah, but Vasad, I think that's the, you know, step three. I think first of all, Step one is not only feasible, it brings a lot of value. If you look at the underlying back office processes for a lot of companies, they're still, um, you know, bound in a hundred year old process, right? Um, you take money transfers. Today, any money transferred from any country to any country, I transfer money, let's say, to JP Morgan in New York or to Barclays in London, it takes two days to settle. And it takes two days to settle because I have to send money to my correspondent in New York, which is dollars, who will convert it and send it to Barclays in the UK, who will then pay the customer uh, in, in there. That's true today. It's with the SWIFT system and so on. Right, uh, right. And the central about, bank's involved in this. Yeah. Yeah. But you think about yeah. blockchain. If I were to able to actually create a value, a token, and I could tokenize and send this token in real time to Barclays in the UK, I could cut two days out of the process. By the way, there's something that we're all actively working on. Uh, we are part. We've got a tech company called Party or with JP, in fact, uh, which is doing that, creating a network to do real-time money transfers and save the T plus two days. Uh, you take trade finance. Today, trade finance is the most cumbersome and paper-intensive process in the world. Somebody exports, uh, you know, iron ore from country A to country B. You got to get tons of documents. It goes to the ship. The documents go to the first bank. It go bill of lading goes, it goes to our side. It's like really, it's, it's prone to fraud because everybody is relying on documents. Now, this is not about decentralized. This is about creating a single ledger where electronically or you know through a tokenized process, everybody shares the same document in real time. So my first step is this. I think the back office of the world can change. And whether it's decentralized or not, you get massive efficiency from changing the back office of the world through doing this. The second is the notion of tokenized value. 
you got to think about the nature of value has always changed. You know, you think about money. Thousand years ago, I, money used to be cowrie shells. And then slowly we moved and technology changed. So money became metal. You could start using ingots and, you know, gold. And then by the printing press came along and so money became paper. And by the 1950s, uh, you know, the plastic came along and money became credit card. Now, it's money, the nature, the form of money of value and value transfer follows technology. So it's not illogical to say that you can tokenize all value and then you can move money around. Frankly, 99% of value is already tokenized. When we transfer money across, it's all bits and bytes. Nobody's carrying sacks of physical scripts or, you know, physical currency. So the second level, this notion that everything that gets tokenized will get tokenized. Right? And this tokenized system means that you can have direct transfer and value exchange. I think that will happen. Right? Now, your third piece, and do you get a completely decentralized world where there is no authority and no regulators? I am with you. I am very skeptical that you'll get to the third piece. So even in the case of uh, currency, I think a central bank digital currency, a uh, wholesale central bank digital currency has value and something will happen. But when you think about Bitcoin, etc., all the scams, this is private money. So the issue there is not use a blockchain or not use a blockchain. The issue is public money versus private money. And I think the notion of private money or lack of regulatory oversight or lack of single control, that is probably a leap too far. First of all, nation states will not give it up. You know, monetary policy control, macroeconomics, they won't give it up. Second is, you got to think, even when people claim that this is, a, you know, a complete crypto or decentralized, there is a DAO sitting at the back of it who's actually orchestrating a lot of stuff. So you're really not as decentralized as you think you're, you are. So I think you will still find players. And which is why I'm, I do, I'm not, you know, people say, oh, this is the end of banking. I don't think so. I think what will happen is that the nature and role of intermediaries will change. You will still need people to orchestrate the customer access. You still need people to orchestrate and create, you know, protocols and so on. So the nature and roles of intermediaries will change. I think uh, some kind of organizing principle, intermediaries, authorities, I think those will stay. But the notion that everything can get tokenized, that value transfer can change and the back office of the world can change, I think that will happen. So what do you think banking is going to look like five years from now? Well, so the issue is uh, the fundamental to me, you know, what drives this thing is customer convenience and customer experience. Anybody who can create a differentiated and compelling customer experience can win. Now that somebody could be a bank, HSBC, or it could be a tech company, Apple. So I don't think it's relevant. Technology is available to everybody. It's you know open source for the most part. So the question is, how do you actually get your mind around focusing on the true customer experience and being able to um, you know remodel uh, the 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 business for that? And if you can do that, I think you can win. So like what you're describing, I guess, is also a world where tech companies become financial services providers. Well, they've been doing it. So they've all been flirting with it. They, you know, few got it. But if you think about Ant Financial, of course, they've run into other political issues. But if you look at Ant Financial in China, I mean, to me, they were my role model. They were raising money electronically. They were lending electronically. They were doing insurance electronically. They had a fund management business. All without any branches, any feet on street, no human beings, all driven by AI models. And they had extraordinary growth and the lowest write-offs and credit problems in the whole system, even today. Right? So are they a bank or are they a tech company? Right? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. No, in fact, you know, I use Ping An as a case study yeah, in, in one of my classes. Study, right? You know, like Ping An versus HSBC. I mean, it was just very different notions of what is an asset. Before we wrap up, you know, one of the things that I asked Tom is like, what does it mean to be a leader in the in this age of AI, right? And without hesitation, he pointed, he said, well, Piyush Gupta, right? And, and that led me to you. Can you answer that question? Like, what does it mean to be a leader these days in the, in the age of AI, a business leader? You know, I think uh, the notion of leadership has made one fundamental change, which is, I think the alpha leadership, which is top down. I mean, I know the stuff I'm going to tell people what to do. That's very hard to do. And frankly, less necessary to do. Today, you've got to have a lot more collaborative, participative leadership. And Frank, it's a good thing because it suits Gen Z and the millennials in any case. But you've got to recognize that the availability of, you know, the next best idea of wisdom is no longer resident in top and senior management. And the reason for this is the nature and notion of knowledge has changed. Earlier, it was who, who knew stuff. Today, Google tells you everything you need to know. So it's no longer who knows stuff. 
then it was who can actually analyze and predict stuff. Now AI can analyze and predict stuff and tell you what it is. So the nature of knowledge has changed. In which case, you've got to figure out that you have to reach in a lot of different places to figure where are the best ideas, how do you coalesce them and take them forward. So in many ways, it's changed. What hasn't changed is the notion of being able to align the company, to get you know commonality, because you get maximum traction from alignment. You get maximum traction from everybody marching in a single direction as opposed to multiple directions. So there's some parts of leadership which are immutable, but the other parts of leadership which you got to be able to evolve and recognize that today's technology lets you do things very differently. So one last question, because I know you got to hop. What's your advice to students these days going into the, the world of business? My advice increasingly is uh, be eclectic in your reading and studying. Because, you know, I, five years ago, I used to say computer science, right? And that's the future, do that. Today, like I said, I'm more and more convinced that our opportunities and problems will not necessarily be STEM. There will be philosophy, there will be psychology. Today, I'm hiring ethnographers in the bank. I'm hiring anthropologists to figure consumer behavior. So I think what will be valued in the world is the capacity to connect the dots, the capacity to be able to figure and make the connection and say, hey, this works with that and what do we need to do? Of course, everybody needs to be literate with everything, including STEM. But I think the capacity to connect the dots would be the biggest uh, value that you give people. And so to that extent, I'd encourage people to be more eclectic than narrow, you know, what, what they're doing. Piyush, thanks so much for this. It's been a pleasure. Been great talking to you. And uh, thanks for, for, for sharing that wisdom. All right. Uh, look forward to maybe getting in touch in person. My, my son studied at Stern many years ago. So I'm partial to the school as well. <laughs> small world, small world. Good to know. Uh, look forward to meeting up in person. Thanks All again, right. Piyush. Take care. Bye now.